And then I have a, a final chapter on my, my own state of, it's an, not a chapter, it's an epilogue, dealing with uh, paper money, uh, starting with the, the question, you know, why didn't Rhode Island come to the Constitutional Convention? Uh, it's an interesting question. They stayed out of the, the United States for two years. They knew what that convention was going to do. It was going to limit their ability to print paper money. Uh, one of the principal evils that um, James Madison, who is crucial in drawing up the Virginia Plan, which becomes the working model for the convention, uh, one of the the evils he saw was the was states printing or colonies and then states printing paper money, and the most notorious of those uh, culprits was the state of Rhode Island, and uh, that's why they stayed away from the convention. Which his Madison and his colleagues says was a good thing because what could Rhode Island offer to to any, anything? But what I tried to do in that little epilogue is show that that paper money uh, was not just to help debtors escape from uh, paying off their creditors, which is what Madison's really concerned about, because you have inflation with a lot of paper money. We know about inflation. You have too much money, money chasing too few goods. And, and that was a problem. But it wasn't just that. Paper money is also capital. And Rhode Island had more banks. Well, I first should back up. You know, what, one thing James Madison, central to his program in the Virginia plan, was a veto power over all state legislation. That is to say, all state bills would have to come to, to the Capitol, to the Congress, and get okayed before they became law. Well, the whole thing is so impractical. That it's, it, it staggers me to think that the other, his colleagues didn't throw it out immediately. Well, they didn't. But the wiser heads finally prevailed, and, and they changed that veto or negative over all state legislation to Article I, Section 10 of the Constitution, which limits the state's ability to do certain things. No, states can't pass tariffs. They can't pass ex post facto laws and they can't print paper money. Now, if that had been enforced, really enforced, in the decades following the revolution, it, it would have stifled the economy. It would have frozen it, because there was not enough gold and silver, which, of course, is the only real money they expected. That would have frozen. What happened was that the states charter banks, which then are free to print the paper money. And no state charted more banks in proportion to its size than Rhode Island. It, it, every town, every little town, 39 towns had banks, sometimes more than one bank, and they're all printing paper money. That is capital. And as a consequence, by the end of the century, economic, uh, uh, Rhode Island became an economic powerhouse. And by the end of the century, the end of the 19th century, the five largest manufacturing firms in the world were located in Rhode Island. Uh, textiles, uh, um, silver, Gorham silver, uh, small tools, and so on. I mean, I won't go, but the largest in the world. Uh, that, so that's a, I just wanted to get that point out so that historians would, would look at this paper money in a different way. Uh, we have no good economic history of the whole period leading up to the Civil War. Of course, the Civil War changes everything. Greenbacks come into play. The federal government taxes the state banks out of business, taxes their print money, their printing of paper money out of business, and suddenly we are into the modern world in the, after the Civil War. But it's an interesting uh, story that I... I I wanted to get out there, even if in a, I 